This is a brand new devotional series and it's called, Where's My Miracle? And I'd say that all of us have prayed for a miracle many times since we were kids. Everyone hopes for a miracle, but I'd say nine times out of 10, we don't get the exact miracle that we're asking for when we pray. Like when we're kids, we might pray for the miracle to get to go to Disney World, because that's the happiest place on earth, right? Some of us get that miracle and others don't, but then we're on to the next one. And maybe when we're teens, we pray for the miracle for that boy or girl to go out on a date with us. And they do, only we found out, find out they're a snake later. Was that God's joke on us, answering our prayer and then realizing it wasn't a good answer at all? Then on into young adulthood, we often pray for jobs or a new house, where we, a job where we can climb the social ladder and even we fall off many times off the rungs and we maybe ask, where's my miracle? Then after we're married, couples pray for babies and sometimes they miscarriage and they lose their hope and maybe never have their own children. Where's their miracle? People get sick, storms come and destroy, and we're found on our knees begging for miracles of the most miraculous kind. And sometimes they come and we rejoice and we try somehow to place a formula on the why and the how that we got God to move for us. And then other times they never come and we grow so weary waiting for that miracle. Where's my miracle? That's the name of this series. So maybe we should look at Webster's definition of what a miracle is. It's a surprising and welcome event that's not explainable by natural or scientific laws, and it's therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. Let me read that again. It's a surprising and welcome event that's not explicable by nature or science, and it's therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. So this first one today is called The Cure, and that definition will be our parentheses, focusing on the work of the divine, his name is Jesus. So maybe we'll start in Luke four, where it says Jesus heals many. And the first kind that we'll offer today is cures. He went into the home of Simon and Simon's mother-in-law had a high fever and the folks asked Jesus to help her. Jesus bent over, rebuked the fever and it left her and it was a miracle. And it says the lady got up at once and started to wait on those in the room. After that, people brought all sorts of sick friends to Jesus and Jesus laid hands on them and he healed them. This woman needed a cure for that fever and she got it instantly from the hand of Jesus, as did many others we read in the scriptures. But here's what to do when we read these stories. We see healing connected to God's love or a person's faith. So we think if God loves us, he'll heal us. Or if we believe hard enough, healing will come. We know as parents that every time our child asks us for something, we don't give it. Of course, we might say, well, we would offer healing always to our children if they're hurting. But as humans, we don't know the deepest needs of people even in our own family, those God has entrusted to us, but he does. I heard another friend put it this way. We're often demanding that God heal this particular sickness or our problem now, while he could be working on something else that's not visible to our eye. In fact, we can rest assured that he is working on the best scenario and the best timing. In this story, when the woman was healed, she got up and waited on her guest. And God knows what we will do with our healing. Will we serve? Will we offer thanks? Will we live a life of gratitude? Or will we go about our business, glad we got what we wanted, and who cares about anyone else? We can speculate all day as to why that woman was healed with a touch and why we can sit by someone for years and they die. What a waste of faith, encouragement, and hope we might think. But placing God in a box of healing being determined by our strength of faith or his healing indicating how much he loves us is dangerous. Saying to someone, if you just have faith, puts the burden of the healing on their shoulders, a heavy load to carry. And saying to another person that God loves you so much, he's going to heal you, ends up leaving that person feeling depressed and abandoned if the healing doesn't come. We're told to have faith, we're told that God loves us, both truth, but these two things are never connected to our standing in the relationship to the Father. Another common human thing we do is speak to the illness and cure it into existence as if our words can bring about a cure. Well, maybe there might be times that God tells us to speak, but tying the outcome of our healing to what we did is never a wise thing. 
We are called as God's children to obey Him in love with our whole being and love others as ourselves. We're told to have faith from reading the Word, and we read about miracle cures in the Bible, and we want those for ourselves. We speak, we pray, we get the best doctors, and then our cure doesn't come like someone else's does. We then have this choice. Will we attach our worth to having to wait? Will we attach our worth and having to wait to God's lack or lack of love thereof? Or will we feel as though we've failed and now God's against us? That might be the true test of our faith right there. There's something to be said for praying and believing and offering up pleas to God and then resting and knowing that our relationship is secure, whatever the answer is. We can't conjure it up ahead of time, the rest. It comes through living a life of relationship with Him. So much of what we experience with God is reflective of that which we experience with our parents, we're told. For example, if my dad's not affectionate, then I don't think God will be affectionate or give me words of affirmation. I found that to be true in my own story. Parents reflect, but they're not the definition of God's love. His love is there for us before we ever came into being, whether we are healed or cured. It's because we are loved that we can pray and ask and then wait and rest. I don't know how to do this. I don't know if any of us do, but I know there's one called the shepherd that takes us and leads us to still waters when we don't know how to find them. He makes us lie down in green pastures when we want to run to and fro and fret. His truth of goodness and mercy tackles us down even when we're not aware of his presence and there's a table of good things to enjoy in the presence of the worst and scariest scenarios of life. Are you praying for a cure? Keep praying and rest in the knowledge that God loves you and yours. Feel your faith waning? Tell him, because faith comes from him anyway, and in our weakness, he's strong. He knows our hearts. I hope you get your cure and miracle today, but I don't know if it will come today or tomorrow. But I knew, do know that with God, all things are possible, and when that cure comes now or later in the hearts of those who are required to be still and wait, then we will get up and wait and serve when the cure comes.